We are live. All right. I see the participant numbers going up as we speak. Okay, everybody. Um, thanks a lot for joining us. It's about 1130 right now on Tuesday. And welcome to part two of our Bay Area real estate series. We're going to talk about the state of the real estate market. For those of you who are on our call about uh, five or six weeks ago, we did the same type of call, but we did it in a few different areas, including the peninsula, the East Bay and the North Bay. So Today, we are going to mix it up big time, and we're going to focus on San Francisco. We're going to focus on Napa, Solano, and of course, you can't forget beautiful Santa Cruz. Uh, my name is Scott Fuller. I am the founder of Leaving the Bay Area and LeavingSoCal.com, and um, I've got some fantastic guests with me today. Before we do the intros here, um, just want to remind everybody this session will be recorded. So if you have an emergency that pops up, you get hungry, you gotta let the dog out, whatever you need to do, um, we will have this recorded. We'll have links available probably by the end of this week on the website. So if you'd like a recorded copy of this, we'll send that to you. The way you do that, info at leavingthebayarea.com, info at leavingthebayarea.com. And who knows, you might know somebody who would benefit from some of the discussion we're having today. So sharing is caring. Feel free to send this off to anybody who you think would enjoy a, a listen. Okay, so um, let's start off. Nicole Solari, why don't you, uh, let's just do like a real brief intro, um, areas you service, your background, and then we'll move it around. All right. Well, as you said, I'm Nicole Solari. I am in the Napa and Solano market here in Northern California. Um, I've been in the business just seven years now, just had my real estate anniversary, uh, number one listing agent in those two respective markets. And uh, just to give you an idea of how many homes we sell, we did about 300 uh, sales last year for just about 150 million. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. Aaron, let's pop over to you. All right. I'm Aaron Bellings. I am one of the uh, main or say head honchos on the Bellings Brothers real estate team. My brother and I are a team here. Born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, we're actually the number one buyers team in San Francisco the last two years. Number three overall team. Um, our sales volume uh, last year is 101 million on 60 or so, 65 or so transactions. And uh, yeah, born, born and raised in San Francisco. So I'm, I'm the city guy. Awesome. Aaron, do you and your brother kind of battle to, you know, to determine who's actually the head honcho? <laughs> Is there a battle uh, royale going on there? It depends on who you ask, but we're, we're very competitive amongst all of our colleagues, but also amongst each other too. So we push awesome. each other to do, to do better all the time. Fantastic. Okay, Ben, take yourself off mute. There you go. Hey, what's happening, guys? I'm Ben Strzok. I'm a real estate broker and a team lead in Santa Cruz County. Uh, we operate in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties primarily. Uh, we have 11 agents on our team, actually 11 clerical staff too, and we are doing about 100 and I think 138 transactions last year and 180 million. And uh, this year, hope, hope to far exceed that. It's all about service. Fantastic. Okay, thanks you guys. Um, again, my name is Scott Fuller. If any of you are considering moving out of the Bay Area, or in most cases, moving out of California, you'd like to talk about, kind of have a consultation, a strategy for what you're looking to do and how to put all this together. That's what we do, we make it very simple. Um, again, you can email us at info at leavingthebayarea.com. We have a Q and A box. We have a chat box. Those are there for you to ask questions. We'd love to field your questions. We're gonna try to answer as many as we can through kind of rapid fire. We're just gonna go through and throw out a whole bunch of information that's awesome. But if you have questions that we haven't answered, use those two boxes to ask those questions and we'll make sure that we get you taken care of by the end. We're looking to run an hour. And so let's get this started. Aaron, I wanna start with you. Um, San Francisco seems to have been a very volatile market more than most in the country in the last 12 months. Tell us a little bit about what's happened, what you've seen happen over the last 12 months and what you're seeing today in the residential market. We won't get up too much into office and retail and things like that, but residential, what are you seeing? Uh, that's a great question. And that is a, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'll do my best to keep it concise and kind of give everybody the rundown. So last year, uh, COVID hit obviously March, April, May, typically our three busiest months of the year were complete ghost town. 
Once June and July hit, it's been absolutely gangbuster since then. So the single family home market specifically has performed exceptionally well over the last, say, nine months or so. Uh, the, condo, the condo and TIC market, and TICs are specific to San Francisco, uh, suffered a bit second half of last year. So things were sitting on the market a little bit longer, taking time to sell. Uh, since June or January this year rolled around, I should say, absolutely crazy. Can't keep anything on the market for more than seven to 10 days. Everything's multiple offers. Everything's going over asking. So it's really the tale of two types of homes, the single family market and the condo market. But overall, the market's been incredibly strong over the last six months. Um, and yeah, I think, did I get everything? I think you did. So let's, no, you're right. We're talking about two significant different property types, right? So the single family, if somebody is reasonably priced for the market, um, what, would, what should their expectation be? What's an average number of offers that you're getting for single family? And then we'll switch over to like the condos, lofts types of thing, properties. What would, you, what would they expect, you know, just as the number of offers and the amount of interest? Yeah, well, I mean, as we know, we're dealing with historically low inventory and like what you read across the country is obviously going to be very different than what's happening in the Bay Area. But San Francisco is no exception to that particular rule. We're about, down about 40% year over year, which is absolutely like crazy to think about. So if single family home sellers, if it's priced appropriately and prepped appropriately, are looking at anywhere from, I'd say, double digit offers, maybe 10 upwards of like sometimes 15 or 20. Um, if things are priced a little bit on the higher side, then that, uh, that number can obviously go down, but the market's incredibly efficient. And what we're seeing right now is the, the places are selling for what they're supposed to be, but then there's always a couple of folks that really want it more than everybody else. And that's really what's kind of driving that last little price jump. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say, you know, around 10 to 15 for single families. Condo TIC market, again, really just depends. We took offers on one of our listings last week. We got 12 offers on one which was a condo and we got six on our single family so you never really know what's going to happen obviously you know very location specific especially mm -hmm. in a city like san francisco prices can change hundreds of thousands of dollars what you move two blocks in the wrong direction so that's uh what that's what we've been seeing but just tons of tons of buyers that are coming back into the market and just not enough inventory for everybody now, Aaron, you make a good point because we talk about different price points, right? And in all of these respective markets, we're talking about, you know, the higher end pricing is going to be different. It's unique to that area in that region. What is a higher end market to you in San Francisco? <laughs> well, that's it's an interesting question because I'd say our, I'd say more of our entry level. I mean, obviously, we have exceptions to the rule, but in order just to kind of like get into the market in San Francisco, you're gonna want around 900,000 to a million. And that can really be for like the one bedroom condo type of situation. Get into that low million range, you start looking at the second bedroom condo situation. Single family homes a few years ago, you could get them under a million bucks. Now, forget it, million four, million five is typically what we're looking at as a minimum. So in terms of what luxury means, I mean, it really depends on the person you're talking to. There's a listing that just hit the market for 34 million. Um, not my listing, unfortunately. Um, but then there's also been a couple of, I mean, I would say luxury in, in the city is probably anything over about five to 7 million. I would consider like ultra luxury and like two to five is just going to be your sort of like entry level luxury, if that makes sense. So, so over 5 million, it sounds like there's not going to be quite as much competition in that price range. So that's going to be, not, or, I mean, not, or maybe not. <laughs> not necessarily. It, we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of folks that are moving from the smaller one, two bedroom condos. The ones that were spending, you know, a million, million, five, two million, ten years ago, and they're now looking at that five to seven million single family. So we've got a couple buyers right now that are in the three to four million range, and we keep getting beat out. So you know, we wrote an offer on a, on a four million dollar condo last week. We were one of, I believe, five offers, and I think we came in second with it. But it's, uh, you know, somebody else paid three hundred thousand dollars more than it was worth. So. You know they can have it at that point, but there's there definitely competition on the upper end as well. Maybe not the 34 million. That one may only have one <laughs> buyer, but everything under that, you're you're seeing multiple offers no matter what the price point. Aaron, we have a question here. So the question is: the single-family housing prices still look soft in the marina compared to previous years. Is this true? Um, we say the single-family home crisis looks soft. Prices. Meaning Single family oh, prices, home prices, prices in, in the marina, specifically in the marina. 
Not, not in my experience. I mean, maybe, maybe this time last year, um, like, you know, as we were settling in, like, you know, trying to figure out what was going on with everything, everyone's still stuck at home, but no, so far everything this year, I don't think you're going to see a single family home on the market that's priced appropriately. That's going to be around for more than seven to 10 days, really. Okay. Um, so that hasn't been the case in my experience. So Aaron, as far as like migration, like where people are coming in from and going to, the people who are coming into San Francisco, not, not, not the move up buyers who are renting or previously owned in San Francisco, where are those people coming from? And then where are you seeing your sellers? Where are they typically moving to? Great question. So, I mean, obviously one of the, the hot button topics, something everyone always loves talking about San Francisco real estate, right? So last year was no exception to that. You know, the migration out of San Francisco, you know, the great epic migration, little overblown in my opinion. Yes, there were definitely some people that left, but urban areas in general tend to be transient. So Michael, my brother and I, you know, the people that we saw that were leaving were people that had one foot out the door anyway. So had leases expiring, you know, whatever was going on, they were going to leave at the end of the, the year. So they left at the beginning of the year instead. Oh, Monty mm -hmm. wants to say hi, of course. <laughs> um, so the people that we're seeing coming into the city right now are really every, a lot of folks that left. So we're getting calls from, you know, friends and family and clients that basically said, hey, we moved up to the North Bay, you know, when, when COVID hit and now we're bored as heck out here. I don't know what we were thinking. I'm like, well, you're not, you know, in your 40s or 50s with a couple of kids. I could have told you that the North Bay is going to be a little bit slower. Um, so we're seeing a lot of folks come back into the city that are ready to start reconnecting with their friends, go back out, you know, the bar, the nightlife scene, all that kind of good stuff. Everyone's kind of chomping at the bit to do that. Yeah. Um, the folks that are leaving are, are sort of what I talked about, the people that had potentially one foot out the door anyway. But us, you know, the people that love living in San Francisco are still here. We never left. Um, and a lot of folks that were buying last year really kind of, I mean, that was a great time to be looking. And the people that knew that they were going to be here for an extended period of time were smart to buy when they did. Um, but the markets we are seeing folks go to are the Austins of the world, Portland, Seattle's, a lot of the young tech, um, yep. you know, millennial, if you will, areas um, that could be in like, you know, different, different states with different pro political climates like Texas. But, you know, if you ever spent a week in Austin, you wouldn't know you were in Texas kind of thing. So those are the sort of the places that we're seeing people move to. Aaron, one more question before we pass it on to Cole here. Um, Suzanne asks, what about SF natives that own legacy income properties that are currently empty or have family members living there with lowered rents? Should we stick it out? Well, I mean, my answer for Susan is probably, it honestly depends on, on what your goals are financially. This is literally the single best time to be a home seller in the history of the world is right now. Like prices in San Francisco are selling, especially for single families, are selling at all time highs. We broke new median highs in August, then again in October, and then again in February. So if there's any time to cash out and sort of ride off into the sunset, now's the time. But the question is always, if I sell, where do I go or what do I want to do? So I think a lot of the question has to do with what your plan is like financially, is this for a retirement goal or is this for the next couple of years? But in order to answer that question, you kind of got to dig into what the goals are and kind of get to the root of it. And then I can give better advice that way. But for anyone that's on the fence of whether or not they want to sell, if you've waited to this point, good for you for waiting this long. But you know, obviously you got to take it with a grain of salt coming from the real estate agent, but now is literally the best time <laughs> in the history of the United States to be a home seller. So. You couldn't have picked a better time. And sometimes it's hard to hear that because, I mean, let's be yeah. honest. When's the best time to buy or sell real estate? Today, all the time. But, exactly. but the reality is, I mean, we're, we're, I think, such a paradigm shift in a lot of markets, a lot of different reasons that there is some, a lot of truth to that. Uh, Suzanne, thank you for that question. And, and also for, I think, a lot of people who ask us the same types of questions. Should we sell? Should we hold? You really have to kind of sit down with your financial planner. You have to sit down with your CPA, you know, like Aaron said and do your long-term financial planning. Does it fit into your long-term financial planning goals? And so there's probably a few more people that should be involved in helping you to make an informed decision on that, on that topic. Okay, Nicole, let's pass it over to you. Napa County, Solano County. What are we seeing in the market in your area right now? How, how, how tough is the competition? What should it, you know, expectations for sellers be right now? You know, if you asked me a year ago 
if I would have believed that the market would have been this hot and this crazy, I would have absolutely disagreed and said that there is no way that we would be where we are today. Um, I actually regret, we, we had a little shorter stagnant period when COVID hit last year than Aaron did. And I regret not taking that like two weeks to just kind of breathe and be, cause I was too worried that we were gonna, it was gonna sustain. So about April of last year, right after shelter in place, it went gangbusters to use this term and we haven't stopped since. Um, so Napa especially has just, the price increases here are up 40% um, year over year and we have 34% less inventory. So I'll let you guys do the math. It's bidding war frenzy. Um, same in Solano, similar numbers, lower price points. So we have a lot more uh, bidding war going on but not a lot of cash in that market. So we're seeing prices kind of capped there. Nicole, who are the typical buyers for these markets? Who's coming in into Napa and Solano County? So in Solano, it's a lot of move up. So a lot of people, you know, who bought their first home, who's moving to a larger five bedroom, maybe want some room to spread out, home office, detached ADU. However, in Napa, we've got folks coming up from the Bay Area, coming up from um, even, you know, San Jose, Gilroy area. And for the first time ever, I'm seeing Southern Californians come in, in here. Really? Um, really interesting yeah I, again not your typical demographic of seeing folks from socal coming you know just here for the weather here for the wine and the, the, the lifestyle nicole for your clients who are moving out of either county where do you see them typically go to and and what are the reasons that they're leaving so very different than aaron aaron said that you know his clients are moving to those those tech austin seattle my clients are moving to middle America. They want land. They want to start, you know, they're cashing out of California and maybe even retiring in their 40s or 50s with the equity that they have and going and buying something for a fraction of the price and just living off the land. Yeah. And I think we're seeing the exact same trends. Like the people who are in the tech industry are going to the Portlands, the Seattles, the Denvers, the Austins. And that's a lot of the younger generation, you know, that's probably in San Francisco and where you're at, maybe there's more of the retirees. Right, people who are kind of on to the next phase, maybe following kids and grandkids. Um, we we had an interesting conversation on one of the last calls that we did, where we talked about you know the concern of natural disasters in the North Bay, in Napa. Are, is that is that a concern that a lot of people have, and is that a reason that some people are, are opting to make a move? Right. I mean, I mean, immediately after fire season, it's a huge conversation. It kind of dies down around this time because it, you know. The weather's beautiful, the mustard's out, everybody's, you know, happy to be out and about and, you know, playing tourists. Um, but I really am concerned about the upcoming fire season and what that's going to look like. It's supposed to be getting better, it's getting worse. And, you know, people are always asking, you know, is this area affected by the wildfires? And I tell them that there's not an area that's affected. Even if you're in the middle of Napa, I mean, the smoke, the smoke damage that I've heard about from insurance claims and you know, just overall your life stops for a week or week plus when these fires hit us. So uh -huh. um, it's definitely a conversation, an ongoing conversation year round. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else, Nicole, that we should know about what's happening in your market um, that sellers should be aware of? Yeah. So for sellers, I mean, to piggyback, now is the time to sell. I mean, it really is. I, you know, I will in all honesty, if I didn't have a small business here and kids in school, I would be thinking about it myself just because <laughs> I cannot believe that we are at all time highs in what these properties are selling for both in Napa and Solano County. Um, as far as on the buyer side, which I know you didn't ask about, but you know, we're seeing a ton of buyer fatigue here. So I would say, you know, for buyers that are coming into this market relocating, which I don't know anybody that really is from other areas other than California, you know, just be ready for that California bidding war. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do have a question from Silsby. Silsby asks, how hard is it to get homeowner's insurance in Napa? And how high has the homeowner's insurance jumped over the last couple of years? So it's actually not that hard. Um, the fire zones in the residential area, so the way that they do the mapping, not a lot of the residential areas actually are in that true fire zone. Um, same thing with the earth earthquake. Um, we're actually having more trouble getting FEMA flood insurance than anything else, which is totally the opposite of fires, but believe it or not, with fires actually comes flooding. And so we're seeing a lot more uh, flood, 
flood insurance issues than fire insurance issues. Interesting. Okay. I wouldn't have thought of that. All right. Fantastic. Nicole, thank you. Mr. Ben Strock, down in uh, Surf City, Northern California, tell us what's happening in Santa Cruz. What have you guys seen in the last 12 months? How has COVID impacted anything? And what's the current market conditions today? So thank you. The interesting thing is listening to Nicole talk, there's a lot more similarities between Santa Cruz market and what we're seeing here in, Sa in the Santa Cruz market. Uh, so the Napa area seems like it had the same spillover from San Francisco and, and South Bay area coming into Santa Cruz and Napa, same kind of effect. Um, those kind of vacation destinations. The first couple of weeks, we were all completely on pause. And like Nicole said as well, that I wish I had, had taken that time to know that the business would still be there and not freaked out and kind of had that panic that we all had with the world was flat. And so that first pause then turned into the storm. And the storm started off with single family homes. And nobody was buying the condo market. They were staying away from the condo townhome market. They were wanting that separation of space. Uh, the homes up in the hills were getting a lot of activity. Uh, the home sellers were saying, oh, wow, my house, now is the perfect shelter in place, retreat and home, things of that nature. The fires did have an effect on that. People are gravitating back towards the beach environments and the beach market in our area has been the strongest market that we've had. Uh, the condo townhome market, we have the shortest supply. I would put that as to, as well when I think about it, is the price point that's there. We have a huge discrepancy. You can still buy a condo or townhome in Santa Cruz County. The median's hovering about 680 single family home, we're closer to one, two right now in the county. So that's a pretty large difference there. And so I think that's put a lot of supply pressure on the condo townhome market. The thing that's constantly talked about, and we talk about this in our office, it's not that we really have a supply issue as much as a demand issue. And the absorption rate, meaning that when Properties are coming onto the market. They're getting absorbed off and taken off the market by the demand really, really quickly. So our year over year sales, when we go back and can't use 2020 as our example this time last year, but we did the statistic in our office and we go back maybe 2019 on our stats for the same month in 2019, we're actually far exceeding the number of sales that are taking place uh, that were taking place in 2019. So the, the sales numbers are way up. It's just, as soon as the supply comes on the market, it has insane demand. And then people are taking it off the market very, very quickly. Uh, so there are still buying opportunities out there in most of the prime locations. It's just, you gotta be on it and you gotta be competitive. You gotta be working with the right agent to get into the house. Uh, the relationships matter now more than ever. And you know we're seeing that these relationships that we're having with other agents in our markets are the difference makers. They're telling us clearly you know, what we need to do. We're seeing a lot more out of area agents and representation from agents who are willing to go just about at any length. You know, People down in Fresno trying to show property in Santa Cruz County. That never used to happen either. And people in LA trying to show property in Santa Cruz County. And, you know, Santa Cruz County is seeing a migration to Monterey County primarily, which is interesting. Uh, that never really happened. And then out of state, you start looking at Arizona, Washington, Nevada, and it's very similar again to Nicole, where they're looking for more space, a bigger home, retirement, potentially a little earlier than they were, not looking in the workforce place environment like Aaron was saying the Austin Texas is that's not very common from Santa Cruz County so Ben regarding the people that are moving in and purchasing in Santa Cruz where are they typically coming from and secondly what percentage of those buyers are purchasing as a vacation rental or a second home so we're cons consistently getting asked the question can I use the property as a vacation rental 
Um, I think the mentality coming over from Santa Clara County, Alameda County, San Mateo County, LA starting to pop up into the picture, Contra Costa County, and we start seeing those people thinking about, hey, maybe I'll retire by the beach, stay close enough to my friends and family. Maybe I can use it as a vacation rental in the interim. And the county has, Santa Cruz County has tightened up on vacation rentals. So they're not able to use them as vacation rentals so as much as they all wanna have these second homes. And it is still a pretty high percentage. Uh, it is getting tighter and tighter on the vacation rental market. Okay. Ben, that's awesome info. Thank you. So I want to circle back around with Aaron. Let's kind of get out our crystal ball. Okay. So we're looking at a lot of different factors that affect the housing market. We're looking at the number of millennials aged 27 to 41 who have been renting for a long period of time are now getting into the buying market. We're looking at record low interest rates, uh, you know, high costs of uh, materials and labor. What, you know, for the rest of this year, or let's just say 12 months out, Aaron, what are you predicting for San Francisco? It's a great question. Well, I always, I always tell my clients, my crystal ball is a little fuzzy, but I'll always do my best. Uh, <laughs> they all are. These questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so to answer the question, it's all, it's dependent on a couple of different factors. So it's a lot of it's dependent on the tech stocks, for example. So if all things continue the way things are going, then there's no signs of anything slowing down. The only thing that would really shift and like, frankly, really help free up inventory in our market is if like Prop 19 starts kicking in and people start transferring their tax basis out of the city. Like I could see that being something that helps loosen up inventory, especially in our markets in California. Um, but as long as everything stays the way that it's been going, the stock market's performing exceptionally well, tech stocks have done insanely well over the last 12 months, then that's really what drives a lot of these sort of positive enthusiasm, uh, optimism, and everything that involves our market. So it's all, it's all really tied to, it's a lot of tech. It's a lot of basically like the more people that get vaccinated and the more people that come back into the city that can go out with their friends or go out to restaurants or don't have to sit outside in a warm San Francisco summer evening um, to you know, eat dinner. If you can go back inside, like that's going to start changing things dramatically. So We've already seen a lot of that. And obviously we think that it's going to continue going in that direction. The one thing that we can't control are the, is, is the unknown. So that's the only thing that I think is really going to stop this train because this train is going full speed, left the station July of last year. And I don't see it slowing down anytime soon, barring some unforeseen event. So Aaron, you mentioned Prop 19. For those who are not real familiar with that, we actually have a presentation we did probably maybe two months ago that's on the website where we covered Prop 19, had some estate of planning attorneys, CPAs. It was very, very good. So on the website, leavingthebayarea.com, there's a link to podcasts and you can find a link to that, uh, the, the segment that we did on that. Um, Aaron, I wanna ask you one more question and I want actually all you guys to answer this as well. So is there, is there a lot of standard inventory right now that will come on the market once homeowners have gotten the second vaccine and feel comfortable with going out and moving where they're moving to and comfortable having people come into their home. Do you see more inventory coming on the market when that happens, Aaron? So in our market, we, I'd say 95% of the homes that hit the market are vacant and staged. So that hasn't really been too big of an issue outside of the multifamily market. Most folks who are selling their homes here have already relocated by the time they call me or the movers are already booked. So I don't, I don't see that as being a huge catalyst necessarily. Obviously, that's going to help. But frankly, all, the most of the homeowners, at least the ones that have like a ton of equity in their places, are all over 55, have all probably already been vaccinated for a couple of months now. So we're kind of just waiting to see what happens. We're all hoping that there's going to be more inventory because this sort of like terror that we've been on is not sustainable. Like the way the prices are growing, they're growing is far outpacing the, you know, obviously income growth, things like that. But the beauty here is that like everyone here has been, you know, obviously there are exceptions, I'm speaking generally, but most of the people here have been employed since COVID hit. Like San Francisco did not hit a huge unemployment issue. So that's why our market has been pretty strong thus far because everyone's saving money. Nobody was going like avocado toast. No one's had a slice of avocado toast in a year. <laughs> And at $14 a piece, I mean, that adds up. 
So, you know, as more people have been saving money over the last years, rents went down, so tenants were able to renegotiate. Where I see a really big um, inventory surge happening and frankly helping, and frankly, it's already there, is the south of market. So those that aren't familiar with San Francisco, you have like traditional postcard San Francisco, Victorians, Edwardians, but then you also have like our concrete jungle downtown, which is called Soma, south of market. And there's been a ton of inventory there. There still is. New buildings are still selling. They're selling quickly. But that's where I see a lot of folks that are coming back in that are going to have to start going to work. They're going to start like picking those up. And I think you're going to see that market start to really rebound and kind of take off over the next six months. But single family home market is just continuing in the correct direction. Just a reminder. If you have any questions, use that Q&A box, use that chat box, happy to answer questions as they come up. Nicole, let's bounce it over to you right now. So what are you seeing for the rest of this year in your market? And is there any influence you know, from COVID from maybe some potential inventory that's going to be coming up at some point this year? Well, I always joke that my crystal ball broke in 2006, so <laughs> I've not been able to predict uh, correctly what has come. And I really can't imagine this sustaining. However, I said that two years ago, I said this last year. And so who knows what's going to happen. I do know that being in two very different markets, um, although very close together, we I see two issues. One is cash in the Napa market. You know, people are going to stop coming from San Francisco and stop coming from the Bay Area. Things start to open back up and they can get out and have their $14 slice of avocado toast and uh, you know, have their life back, so to speak. And then in the Solano market uh, loans, we just can't keep these sub 3% loan, loan uh, uh, interest rates. Like it's just, it's not sustainable. So um, I think loans is really the only thing that's kept Solano from just going absolutely insane. We're getting offers 30% over asking. And then, you know, they're only selling 15 to 20% over asking because of uh, buyers not able to bring in cash to close. So I, I do think that there will be a shift. There will be a slowdown for both of those reasons in my market. And then when the fires come in October, I mean, we just stop for a couple of weeks, depending on how long those fires last. Okay, Ben, I want to push it over to you. Do you eat avocado toast? <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't you? Okay, awesome. <laughs> anything special you put on it? You sprinkle anything on? Uh, no, but avocados are good for you. I love that. Um, th there's a lot of things. Really, you can only predict what you have in front of you, right? So we know what the market is today and what our current environments are. Everything else becomes a little bit of a guessing game. We all know that if interest rates change, we will see a, a change in the market. I've been selling real estate for 20 years or very damn close to 20 years. And I've watched cycles. What tends to happen is that sellers get more and more aggressive over time. And if inventory starts picking up and home prices keep elevating, sellers are always going to push to that next level. And as Aaron previously had said, the ones that are appropriately priced tend to get all the offers. And then when they price them really high, with what the last sale had been, and they're way up at the top of the market, then they may sit there on the market and we'll, cyclically, we'll often start seeing more inventory start building a little bit. Home sellers putting in prices higher and higher. And then the market, if rates change at all, that's kind of one of the X factors, or maybe you have the fires, or maybe you have the stock market or whatever it might be, the next COVID coming around that you can't predict, then all of a sudden that puts the pressure on. But right now with where demand is and where interest rates sit and the stock market being strong and the fact we're not in the fire season and we don't have in coronavirus slowing down, there's no economic indicators that are showing us potentially, you know, having a collapse or having some major slowdown in the future. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. We have a question here. Michael asks, and this is for everybody, so chime in. Where are the best opportunities to buy today or where would you buy in the future? So let's say maybe from an investment purchase standpoint. Where would you guys go? What do you like? 
I'm happy to jump in. Uh, Michael, Michael's my brother. So there's the uh, the other half of the balance. Oh, team participated in there. <laughs> uh, so I, I previously mentioned it, but right now, South of Market, they're, they're, that's the only place you can get inventory. That's the only place. I tell people in San Francisco, if you can ever get in a time machine and buy from five years ago, do it. And right now, we're seeing prices from 2016, 2017, 2018 in South of Market. That's what people are paying today. So I really like the idea of buying at prices from years ago. So I really like that particular area. And then in terms of like the rest is just like kind of the fringe. So like the center of San Francisco, like I said, if you go two blocks in one direction or a different direction, it could be a half a million dollar difference for the exact same uh, piece of real estate. So if you can buy something on the outside of the city, maybe a little bit closer to the ocean, I always joke, I say, San Francisco is the only city in the world where it's cheaper to live by the beach. So I love those areas. Um, I think those are like great opportunities where, you know, the fog tends to roll in, but you know, I went to high school out by the ocean and from what it was 20 years ago, it's not as much fog as there used to be. There's definitely more beach days. So I would be buying in like the outer parts of the city. So as it continues to get more expensive, those are the spots you want to be. Awesome. Nicole, what, what about you? What about in your market? Where would you advise and in, in putting money into? I would not advise if you're investing to invest in California, but I am, you know, looking at things all over the nation all the time. And it's just insane to me that you can buy something in some of these cities for under a hundred thousand, just a cosmetic fixer and a turnkey home for $250,000 with land. I mean, it just blows my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, when you talk about losing your pants or losing your shorts or whatever, the, when you lose 50% of a $50,000 investment versus Aaron saying that you can't even get in anywhere in the city, you know, under a million, I'd rather lose, you know, half of my 50,000 investment. So I, I can't, I can't imagine investing in California right now. Well, so let's, let's, let's change the question a little bit. What if somebody was to say, okay, I have an opportunity to move out of the city, out of the North Bay, or, or really maybe even Sacramento. And so, Nicole, where are some of the pockets where you see opportunity for me to live, you know, primary residence? Where are some of the opportunities where you, where you see good opportunity? So I think Vacaville, which is a little sleepy town, well, it used to be a sleepy town. Now it's, you know, got every store you could possibly imagine, factory outlets, you know, Kaiser just moved there, Genentech just moved there. Yep. I think Vacaville is just going to continue to grow, even, you know, if there is some kind of uh, correction in the market because we have the military there and then you know they're building out more and more infrastructure to support the people that were relocating even pre-COVID from the uh, the corporations that are moving there. So is that kind of like um, Vacaville would that be Green Valley I guess that's more Fairfield it's, area but it's the end of Solano County on the north side so right before you get into the Davis Woodland area mm -hmm. it's it's hot it's hot in the summer it's hot in the winter it's it's a good climate, but I mean, sometimes it gets up, you know, above a hundred, everybody has a swimming pool. Um, but, you know, a couple of years ago, the median price was in the 400s. It's now in the 700s. Wow. A couple of years ago, I, I literally mean like two, two and a half years ago. Wow. Okay. I read something that said Vacaville Fairfield was number one in the nation, like month over month or year over year or something. I, I, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I've, I, I don't even have time to stop and read the news. I'm so busy. So it's, <laughs> I just can't believe it. Yeah. Well, that would make sense because you have a lot of people that are saying, okay, you know, that's not necessarily the Bay Area. I mean, I don't know if it, technically if it is. So, you, But you have people coming from the Bay Area, San Francisco. But then a lot of people are being priced out of Sacramento right now and Davis, right? So then it's like, okay, what's left? I'm going to go to Vacaville, Fairfield, Woodland, um, or, you know, somewhere that's going to be kind of, you know, north or east of Sacramento. So. I can, I can see where it's coming from. That's just wild, those numbers you're, you're telling. Um, Mr. Strzok, what about you? What are some of the pockets that you like in I your backyard? The, I love the question because, you know, it's a question and there's a difference. You know, are you looking for cash flows? Or are you looking for appreciation future? You know, somebody might say, you know, investment-wise, you go out to the middle of the country and you're going to buy a $100,000 property. You might get $800 a month in rent on it. You might get an eight cap rate return. Uh, whereas here you buy in Santa Cruz, you might spend a million dollars, but maybe your appreciation might be at 10% and you're getting cash flows on it too. And it's hard to gauge. 
in Santa Cruz County, and I don't know the building requirements and restrictions that exist in other areas throughout the state, but here in Santa Cruz, it's extremely stringent. It is really, really hard to build, almost impossible. We have water supply issues. All our water comes from the groundwater. And so unfortunately, we're not able to get water permits in order to build. And that puts building permits just being insanely difficult and a lot of remodels and things like that. So with that issue, it's much better when you have a really limited supply and the coast coastline, all the beach properties, they're not making any more of them. You just can't build there. You can't subdivide. You can't add floors on. You can't you know, build a high rise or anything to that degree. So coastal properties long-term have been the best appreciation in Santa Cruz County and have seen the highest demand. So let's, let's um, change directions just a little bit. And this is going to lead into our next question. Right now, sellers are aware of what's happening in the market. Right. They, they're aware that their neighbor's house had 10, 15, 20 offers, X number of dollars over asking price. And so it kind of comes down to, hey, when I'm ready to sell, we'll just put it on the market and it's going to go like that. And there's nothing I need to do to the property. OK, I'm, I'm getting some no's here. All right. So what I want to dive into now is we know that there is a lack and a shortage of inventory. We know that there's a high buyer demand. Um, but we also know that there still are certain things you should do to your home to be able to get top dollar. Before I have you guys go into that, let's get to our next question. Samuel asks, as a seller, is it worth it to paint, refloor, and landscape or front yard or simply sell as is? Since we're in a seller's market, it seems like more buyers, there's more buyers who are watching for homes that fit their requirements. So who wants to go first on that? I'm, there, I'm ben, to Ben's up. Um, this, this happens to be our forte in our company. We have an entire team on this. I feel so passionately about it um, because as a seller, you want the most people through your home. And the way that you're going to have the most people through your home is and maximize your exposure is by having it present well. And for somebody else to be able to envision themselves living in your property. And the way we can market things well is when they present well. So it's really hard for us to market a home that doesn't show particularly well or isn't going to appeal to the masses. So we need to try and maximize uh, or minimize the amount of things somebody thinks they have to do in order to maximize your exposure. And then the marketing efforts really can come into play and the sellers tend to win. The, the improvements on that light level that you mentioned there with paint, reflooring and landscaping, that's stuff you can do within a few weeks. That's not something that's gonna take months, a kitchen remodel or something to that degree that you might miss a certain market or something may change. A few weeks, you shouldn't see enough of a change in a market. Real estate markets typically don't change overnight and you should be fine and you should go through with that effort for max marketing. Yeah, I 100% agree with Ben. Um, something my brother and I are very passionate about is, and, and I know these three here also, is that the reason people hire us is because we give them the best advice. So every market's gonna be different, every property is gonna be different. But in general, what Michael and I like to do is we help people what we call flip their own homes. So what can so what what dollar can we put in to get four or five dollars out on the back end? I'm not talking about a hundred thousand dollar kitchen remodel that's going to yield a hundred thousand dollars in value. I'm talking about five to seven thousand dollars worth of countertops that are going to yield fifty thousand dollars in value. That's a ten x return. So we love helping people flip their own homes, doing that kind of stuff. And people always say, well, well, you know, is this going to cost me? How much is this going to cost me? Like, is this really worth it? This and that. We've done so many experiments where we've tried to sell homes as is. Um, most recent example, we had a home out in the outer Richmond, uh, you know, which is the north side of town here. Put it on the market as is. Got two, two to three offers, million, million one. I can't remember exactly what the numbers were. Told the sellers like, no, we're not going to take these. Let's take it off. Let's do our thing and let's put it back on. Sure enough, we had it on the market five weeks later. 
invested about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, and we ended up getting closer to one five for it. So we're talking wow. about a thirty thousand dollar investment that yielded four hundred thousand dollars. And people always say, like, you know, well, why should I do this or this and that? It's like it takes me more time and energy to spend four to six weeks prepping your house. I'd love to just put it on the market, but the reason that we're the best at what we do is because we help people get the next level. And in order to do that, it's got to show well. It's got to be priced well. It's got to be presented well. You got to have a good agent behind you. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to put here too is that something that we, we tell all our sellers about is, especially in San Francisco, it might be different in other markets. People that are buying here, they want it. They want turnkey because what they want to do is they want to close on the home and throw a party the next day. So it's really all about like I, even if it takes two weeks and fifteen thousand dollars, you just bought a two million dollar house. They don't want to do it. They want to move in and they want their buddies there drinking with them the next day. So like whatever we can do to get this place so it's party ready or like, you know, friend ready, family ready. That's what we want to do, because that's really what's going to get the people to get their checkbooks out. Really Nicole, quickly, anything you also, want to Scott, about? just to reiterate. Go ahead, Ben. What Aaron just said right there is one of the biggest problems that, in mindset. Their focus is on what is this going to cost me? It's not about what it's going to cost them. It's about what it's going to make them mm -hmm. and how much they're going to gain out of it, not versus how much it's not a loss. This is, we're trying to do this. It's better for all of us. We don't want to put in the effort, but we have to, to get the max dollar. Also, like there's tons of programs. I know through Compass, we have Compass Concierge where you can actually borrow this money uh, interest-free for up to six months to do the work. And my brother and I did Bellings Brothers Concierge prior to joining Compass, where we actually front anywhere from fifteen dollars to $25,000 for our clients, get reimbursed out of the proceeds, no hidden fees, no nothing. But it's really, it, I can't tell you how important it is to spend a little bit of money. It goes such a long way. But you really have to be careful where you spend it. You really want to get that three to five X return. And I, one thing that I'll add to this, I think there's two types of planning that goes into getting your home ready for sale, or at least have started to have that discussion. It's the planning that we're talking about, right? The, the, the work, which usually is a small amount of work, but a great yield for you to get the home prepped and ready for sale. But the other piece of it is the financial planning part of it. And, and the problem that we're running into that I'm noticing more and more because we are in such a fast moving market, people are going to Zillow, Redfin, Realtor to get their estimate. The first problem is those estimates can be, you know, a hundred thousand, you know, several hundred thousand dollars off from each other, which tells you which one is accurate. Well, none of them usually, but the other piece of it is home. You shouldn't be basing your financial planning based off the net that you're going to get from your home, based off of what those websites give you. So what you should be doing is talking to a, a top local real estate broker like these people here and finding out from them, okay, what, what it's going to give me the best ROI on investing in my home to prep it for sale. But secondly, based off of today's current market, act, you know, uh, where we're at in the market, how much can I expect to net from the sale? And you guys will prepare what we call a net sheet, which essentially says, okay, if today's market value is this amount minus, you know, the, what you owe on, on liens, anything like that, here's what you can expect to walk with. And that's very helpful for a lot of people to plan their move, their next purchase. How much do I have to spend? How much am I going to need for retirement? How much do I need to invest? How does that impact my tax liability on my sale? Right? So make sure that you're doing the right things when you're prepping your home for sale versus saying, oh, you know what, it's a seller's market. I'll just, you know, find the, the, the guy who ends up, you know, dropping something in the mail to me, list with them, and I'll be on my way. Um, Nicole, anything that you wanted to add to what we've talked about? I love that I have two in, an, an insight into two very different markets because my Napa market is a lot like Aaron and Ben's. And I agree, you know, folks moving here, they want they want their house furnished before the day that they close so that the next day they can literally move in with all brand new furniture. So, you know, down to, you know, I've seen invoices for napkin rings, you know, everything needs to be delivered brand new. 
But in Solano, it's completely different. Um, you know, the ROI on doing things, even sometimes cosmetic, just isn't always there. For example, you know, we can list a home as is for 500,000 and probably get over asking. We can list that same home, putting $20,000 worth of work into it and list it at 520 and still get a little over asking, but you're spending a dollar to make a dollar. And at that price point, it just doesn't always make sense. So we really have, you really have to be, you, you have to choose a realtor that can be honest and not just tell you those things to make their job easier. And I think a lot of times in Solano County, you know, these sellers have these expectations that if they spend, you know, $30,000 on cosmetic work that they're going to get $100,000. But we just, the market caps itself because it is a FHA, VA type market. Every, every market's going to be unique and every home's going to be unique. It's, it's not a one size fits all. And that's why you really have to understand what are my options and, and you know, how do we put this together? Okay, so a couple more questions here. Um, this is more of a comment from Samuel. Thank you for your input. Family and friends have been driving me crazy. Tell me to sell as is and quit fixing the house. Uh, now I can tell them why they are wrong. Samuel, smart guy. Okay, perfect. Also, um, hire, hire a realtor, Samuel. You, you don't do it alone. Let somebody help well, you. We don't, if we don't if, if you're working on it, Samuel, con contact us. Contact me at info at leavingtheberry.com. We'll get you in touch with the right person based off of where you're located at. Uh, Suzanne has a question. What's the thought on St. Helena, where we hear at least once a week that someone is leaving? Um, Nicole, I don't know if that's necessarily your area. It, Any thoughts on that? It is. I, I haven't really heard that some that people are leaving St. Helena. Um, St. Helena is okay. very much second, third, fourth, fifth, 27th home market. Um, very rarely is it owner occupied live there full time. Even the school, you know, even people with school age kids, they're there in the school year and leave in the summer. So I, I, I personally haven't heard that, but I could see, you know, people being affected by the fires uh, more so than ever last year, it went up Valley for the first okay. time. And Suzanne mentions that's where we own our primary residence and where we currently live. Um, Suzanne, mm -hmm. that might be a, a great topic to take off uh, offline with Nicole. Um, and ben, Scott, I, want, I wanted to jump in. I think this is a good opportunity to say, don't believe everything you read because 90% of the time, none of it's true. Like we like <laughs> the, the kind of stuff that I hear people ask me all the time. And I'm like, who, where do you read this stuff? So it's it, don't always believe everything you read. The media loves to sensationalize things. The number one question I get from new buyers, for example, from San Francisco go, can we afford to live here? We don't have $2 million cash. I'm like 95% of people that write offers here get financing. Nobody wants to write about cute young couple pays asking price gets home with financing. They want to, <laughs> they want to write about the million dollars over asking all cashes. So don't always believe everything you read, everyone. <laughs> Aaron, you've cracked the code, my friend, 100%. Okay, we have a question for Ben. Sue asks, Ben, where is the best value in Santa Cruz and Monterey? Hey, Sue, uh, thanks for the question. Um, Surprisingly, Monterey County actually has some better values than Santa Cruz right now. Uh, you can actually get a little bit more bang for your buck in a Pacific Grove, Monterey. The biggest values probably are, or the best values if you're looking for something Oceanside might be a seaside marina uh, area. You're welcome. I guess All right. Talking about too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Seaside sounds like Siri, so therefore Siri started talking to me. Um, anyway, in Santa Cruz County, it, there are areas that are a little bit inland that we're seeing price levels a little bit lower than they are maybe right by the coast. But if you go a few blocks in, you start seeing a little bit better value. Lots of places you can ride your bike to the beach, uh, short, short distance, half mile, uh, something to that degree, you start getting a little bit better value. I'm uh, certainly happy to talk in further depth there. We'll let Scott continue to roll. Okay, Sue, thanks for the question. Great question, by the way. Okay, we've got a couple minutes and I can't believe it. We're gonna wrap this thing up at 1230, exactly one hour. 
Oh, I love it. Um, while we're getting some just some last comments here, if anybody has any last questions or if it's something you'd like to ask off offline, again, info at leavingthebarrier.com. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists here. Love you guys. Fantastic resources. You guys just do a, a fa fantastic job and appreciate your taking your time. Any last thoughts, um, that things that we didn't cover? Any gotchas? Any well, anything? The, the number one thing I tell all my clients is the good agent's going to give you good advice. And the best advice I can give everybody on this call or with real estate in general is, well, my brother and I like to call the three Fs. If it's good for your family, your finances, and your future, do it. Don't try to time the market. Don't try to do like, is it the top? Is it the bottom? What do I do? If it's time to move, it's time to move. I have people that bought two, three years ago said, I don't know if it's the right time. The market's so high. Two or three years ago, you bought in San Francisco. You're doing, you're doing okay. So always three Fs. If it's the right time for you, it's the right time to make, to make a move and do something. Love that, Aaron. Yeah, people ask us all the time, when is the right time to sell? And the right time to sell is when you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. The answer to the question usually is yes. <laughs> When's the right time to sell? Yes. If it's right for you, then it's right. Um, okay, well, if we didn't miss anything else, uh, thank you to all of our attendees. As I mentioned before, we'll have a recorded copy of this available later this week. Send us an email. We'll make sure we get you a copy of that. And please feel free to share it with anybody who you think might find this content irresistible and unbelievable and everything else. Completely awesome. So, all right, guys. Good catching Thanks, up with you. Look forward to the next one. Everybody Thanks take care. Us. Stay safe and we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye for now.